There has been a lot of interest in the field of neuromodulation in psychiatry. Can you tell us what might be the potential reasons uh, for this interest? Well, in my view, um, I think we're really in, in, in psychiatry and psychology facing a paradigm shift. Uh, I think we're really moving uh, to a place where it used to be mainly dominated by the neurotransmitter models, uh, mm -hmm. so to say, the, the, the pharmacology model, which has, has had, had quite some, um, some uses, of course, and in the sense of antidepressants, antipsychotics, and the many drugs that have been around. I think what we've been finding out more and more is that there's this homeostatic process. Uh, if you put something into the body for a long time, the body will adapt to it. And we've seen in the treatment of ADHD, for example, that methylphenidate is very effective in the treatment of ADHD. However, uh, it, the longer you start prescribing it, the effects will wear out to some degree. And it has been shown, for example, that the DOT uh, receptor will be upregulated with chronic exposure to methylphenidate. So there will be this homeostatic uh, drive. With antidepressants, we know they're still effective, but we also know that people that, keep, that start taking it for a second uh, treatment of depression, they might develop what we call treatment resistance, uh, which could be conceived of as a kind of homeostatic uh, process as well. So I think this new model of neuromodulation, uh, which entails deep brain stimulation, and we all know the example of deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's mm -hmm. disease, maybe as well in, in depression and OCD, uh, RTMS, neurofeedback, and many of these technologies uh, or really uh, part of the neuromodulation family. I think the important difference here is that we're not going into chronic administration whereby a homeostatic uh, drive can be developed, but we're tapping into neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is what we do every day uh, by learning information uh, and rewiring neural circuitry. Uh, and that seems to be, I think in my view at least, a much more powerful way of interfering with brain activity, mm -hmm. um, yeah, which could be a more powerful way with fewer side effects towards the future. I think aligned with that is also the notion that since 2010 we have bas basically seen that the, the majority of the pharmaceutical companies have withdrawn themselves uh, from psychiatry. Uh, they basically stated they, they, they're they not making enough money or the investments they have to make in CNS, uh, central nervous system diseases, does not outweigh uh, the, the, the earn, earn back they can make based on, on those drugs. Um, so uh, GlaxoSmithKline, Pfizer, mm -hmm. I think there's only two or three small companies left that are still investing uh, in antidepressants, antipsychotics. Yeah. Uh, I think a similar development, unfortunately, uh, we've seen a very big development in neurology which was still intact. Uh, we saw many people investing into uh, drugs for the treatment of Alzheimer, uh, but there we all already see some drugs failing uh, and many people uh, considering to withdraw uh, the research and development there as well. So it looks like the brain is still something mm. that can not only be fixed by pharmacology. We need different techniques there. Psychotherapy is, of course, one option, uh, which in a sense might be seen as kind of neuromodulation as well. Mm. Uh, but I think the neuromodulation techniques can potentially be more specific and more targeted.